expected value variance standard deviation so these are further applications of probability let us say that you are looking at the returns on your stock and you will have different returns depending on the state of the economy if the economy is in a recession the probability of a recession is 0.25 and in this state the return will be minus 10% in a normal state the probability of which is 50% the return is 8% and in a boom probability 0.25 the return is expected to be 0.22 now if you don't know which of these three states will happen how do you come up with the expected value for your return all you do is the probability of a recession times the return if there is a recession which gives you minus 0.025 plus probability of a normal economy times the return in a normal economy which is 0.04 plus probability of a boom times the return expected return in a boom which is 0.05 add all these up and you get 0.07 so we can say that the expected value for our return is 0.07 which is 7% how do you calculate the variance clearly you have different possible returns and hence there is a certain variance of returns the way you calculate the variance first step is to understand and calculate the expected return we have already calculated the expected return is 0.07 what we need to do is we need to multiply the probability of each event with the deviation from the expected value square that multiply it by the probability and add up the numbers best understood through a quick example let's continue with the recession normal economy and boom probabilities that we just saw we've seen these return numbers before now this column shows the probability of the event times the return in that event so 0.25 into minus 0.1 is 0.025 so so actually this was this was used to calculate the expected value to calculate the the variance we take the probability of that event so probability of recession being 0.25 multiplied by the deviation of the return from the expected value so in this case the return is minus 0.1 the expected value is 0.07 so the deviation is 7 plus 10 which is 17 percent so 0 0.17 so you multiply these out and you will get uh, so actually you you take this deviation 0.17 and you're supposed to square it so the squared deviation multiplied by the probability gives you 0 0.00723 do the same thing here in the second row the probability is 0 0.5 the deviation between 0 0.08 and the expected value is 0 0.01 square that and multiply by the probability that gives you this number and finally for the boom situation probability is 0 0.25 multiplied by the deviation here is is 0.22 so 22% minus 7% which is 15% which is 0 0.15 square and you multiply these out and you will get 0 0.00563 add these three numbers and you get 0 0.0129 so this is the variance and to find the standard deviation you simply calculate the square root of the variance and that will give you 0 0.1136 now let's talk about covariance covariance is a measure of how two variables move together 
So let's say that you have the return on stock A and the return on stock B and you are looking at these returns over the last 100 months. So you're looking at monthly returns. If you notice that in general, whenever the return on A is positive, the return on B is also positive. And if when the returns on A are negative, the returns on B are also negative, that means that the covariance between the return on stock A and the return on stock B is positive. On the other hand, if you notice that whenever A is up, B is down and vice versa, that would imply that the covariance is negative. So essentially, covariance is a measure of how two variables move together. Values can range from minus infinity to positive infinity. So positive numbers means that the returns move together. Minus numbers means that the two variables move in opposite directions. The problem with covariance is that the unit is difficult to interpret. So what does a covariance of 70 mean? And that's hard to say. What this tells you is that the covariance is positive, which, which gives you some information, but the exact interpretation of this 70 is difficult. And as has been said, covariance is positive when two variables tend to be above their expected values at the same time. So now how do we calculate covariance? Uh, for the way we do this is for each observation, we multiply each probability times the product of the two random variable deviations from their means and we sum this together. Uh, this would be better understood through an example. So again, let's look at the returns on stock A and stock B. So to interpret this table, let's say that there are three states of, uh, of the economy. Again, we have a, a boom and average and recession. So let's say that this is the, this is the boom situation. So if the economy is booming, the probability of a boom is 0.15. And in this state of the world, the return on B is expected to be 40% and the return on A is expected to be 20%. Then we have an average state. So if the economy is average, the probability of that is 0.6. And in this average economy, the expected return on B is 20% and the expected return on A is 15%. And if the economy is in a recession, the probability of that is 0.25. In a recession, the expected return on B is 0% and the expected return on A is 4%. The first thing to do when you are calculating the covariance is to come up with the expected return of A and the expected return of B. We have already learned how to do this. To come up with the 13%, you take a weighted average of these three returns weighted based on the three probabilities. So 0.15 into 20% plus 0.6 into 15% plus 0.25 into 4% will give you a expected return on stock A of 13%. Using the same logic, you calculate the expected return on B which is 18%. So that's step one. Then step two, to calculate the covariance between the returns on A and B, you take each, each cell over here. So the probability there is 0.15 times 0 0.2 minus 0 0.13. This 0.2 is the return on A assuming a boom minus 0.13 is this expected value of A. And similarly for B, 0.4 is the expected return on B in a boom. Minus 0.18 is the expected return, overall expected value for the return on B. So do the same thing then for this cell where we have where we are assuming uh, average economy. So same logic here gives you this row. And finally, for the recession, you have 0 0.25 times 
these numbers that are based on on this cell so 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 do this calculation and you will end up with a covariance of 0.0066 now as has been mentioned this tells us that there is a positive correlation which means the positive covariance which means that these two variables generally move together but what does the 0 0.0066 mean and that's much harder to interpret to address the challenge of interpreting covariance we come up with another measure called correlation which is simply a standardized measure of the linear relationship between two variables and the correlation between two variables a and b is simply equal to the covariance of a and b divided by the standard deviation of a times the standard deviation of b so this is an important formula to memorize the values of co of correlation range from plus 1 which means perfect positive correlation to minus 1 which would mean perfect negative correlation correlation is sometimes written using this greek symbol so correlation equal to 0 would mean that there is absolutely no covariance and no correlation between the two variables sometimes if you are dealing with sample data the symbol typically used is r which is the correlation coefficient for sample data and as i just mentioned this is the symbol and i forget what the symbol is called this is the population uh, so if you are dealing with population data then this symbol tells us what the uh, this symbol tells us the correlation so now let's do a simple example the covariance between two assets is 0 0.0046 the standard deviation for a is given and standard deviation for b is given what is the correlation the correlation between a and b will be equal to the covariance between a and b so that's a and b divided by the standard deviation of a times the standard deviation of b which is so the covariance between the two assets is 0 0.0046 divided by the product of the two standard deviations 0 0.0623 times 0 0.0991 so do the calculation you should get something between 0 and 1 and that is the correlation between A and B ok so now we will talk about the multiplication rule and we will talk about factorials if one task can be done in n1 ways given the first task the second task can be done in n2 ways and the third task can be done in n3 ways the number of ways in which k tasks can be done is n1 into n2 into n3 all the way to n k let's take an example let's say there are three steps in an investment decision process the first step can be done in two ways the second can be done in four ways, the third can be done in three ways. The total way of doing these steps is 2 into 3 into 4, which is 24. Uh, another point is, which comes very often is the factorial. So let's say that you can assign four security analysts to four industries. And the first one can be assigned in four ways then obviously the second can be assigned in three ways the third can be assigned in to the two remaining industries and finally the fourth one is the only one who has left so he's just assigned to one industry so the number of ways in which we can assign four security analysts to four industries is four into three into two which is twelve twos are twenty four labeling 
So labeling is where there are n items of which each can receive one of k labels. The number of items that receive label 1 is n1. The number of that receive label 2 is n2 and so on. The total must add up to the number of items. The number of ways in which labels can be assigned is n factorial divided by n1 factorial, n2 factorial up to nk factorial. Again, this understood through an example. Let's say you have a portfolio that has 8 stocks and the goal is to designate 4 as a buy, 3 as a hold and 1 as a sell. In how many ways can these labels be assigned to 8 stocks? So what is n? Here n is equal to 8 and we have 3 stocks. Uh, so the way this will work with this formula, you will apply n is 8, so you have 8 factorial and then 4 factorial multiplied by 3 factorial multiplied by 1 factorial. Where did this 4 come from? This is because we are saying that the label of buy is is going to be um, so the goal is to designate 4 of the stocks as a buy. So since you can designate 4 stocks as a buy, you have 4 factorial here and 3 as a whole, so that's this 3 and 1 as a cell, so that's 1. You do the calculation and you will see that the answer is 280. Combinations. So combination formula is a special case of the labeling formula where k is equal to 2. Don't necessarily need to know that, but what is more important is to understand what this term means. Combinations refers to the number of ways to choose r objects from a total of n objects. Uh, it is written as n, so ncr, sometimes you will see it written as ncr this way. Now, Let's take an example where a portfolio manager wants to eliminate four stocks from a portfolio that consists of six stocks. So if you have six stocks A, B, C, D, E and F, what are the number of ways in which the manager can pick four stocks where the order doesn't matter? So picking A, B, C, D is the same as picking D, C, B, A and so on. So this is an example of a combination. It would be written as 6C4 and the way we calculate this is n which is 6, 6 factorial divided by n minus r which is 6 minus 4, 2 factorial multiplied by r which is 4 factorial. The faster way of doing this is on the calculator and that's what you need to do on the exam. So to do this on the calculator what you do is type in 6 and then second and the NCR button and then you click in 4. So let me do this on my calculator. 6 second NCR 4 is equal to and you should get the answer 15 and finally the last point in this lecture is on permutations according to so with permutations we get the number of ways to choose r objects from a total of n objects where the order in which the r objects are chosen does matter the way this is written is npr sometimes you see it written like this and this is equal to n factorial over n minus r factorial. Let's look at an example. So if you have 8 stocks, we decide to sell 3 stocks. So let's say the 8 stocks are A, B, C, D, E, F, G and H. And we need to sell 3. Let's say A, B, C. Now here the order matters. So selling A then B then C is considered different from selling C then B then A. Okay, so what's how do we calculate this? Eight stocks 
and we want to sell 3. So this can be written as 8p3. The formula would be 8 factorial divided by 8 minus 3, which is 5 factorial. So you can do the calculation, but again, I would suggest that you do this using the calculator. So on the calculator, you would simply type in 8 second NPR over here and then 3 is equal to. So let me do this very quickly on my calculator. So 8 second NPR 3 is equal to and you should get 336. So that is it for this rather long reading on, um, on statistics and uh, probab actually this reading is on probabilities so as I keep suggesting you need to go back and uh, practice as many questions as possible from the curriculum and from your study notes.